Wow. Uh, let's just get right into this because we have a special episode of the Carmudgeon Show today on the Cybertruck. Friday. A Friday episode. First ever. First, I think so. Uh, I had the incredibly honorary, honorable, whatever. Tesla was stupid enough to give me full access to the engineering behind the Cybertruck to sit through a crash test, to drive it, to race it, to off-road it, to do anything I wanted to, including shoot it, which I did not do, um, but I did hit with a large hammer repeatedly. Um, and uh, I believe... Uh, this episode will launch at the same time as the embargo for the other two people on the planet who have driven this outside of Tesla. So um, I think we should dive right into it and allow our esteemed audience to hear all there is to know about the engineering behind the Tesla Cybertruck. Oh, this is the Carmudgeon Show. You're Jason Camisa. I'm Derek Tam hyphen Scott. This is part of the Haggerty Podcast Network. And if you like this content or any of the other bullshit that we do, uh, please feel free free to consider joining the Haggerty uh, Drivers Club, which includes unlimited roadside, <laughs> unlimited towing, 24 seven towing, uh, um, unlimited access to evaluation tools, an award-winning magazine, and access to special events and discounts. Yep, you got it. Your chair is self-lowering. Yeah. It's like an old um, Mercedes 600 or 300 SEL with the air suspension. You that. just turned a furniture discussion about my cheap uh, seats into a car thing to do with Mercedes, which must mean we're rolling and this is the Car Mountain Show. Yes. I mean, I could have done a Citroen reference too. Yes, but instead you chose an old Mercedes, which, yes. you know. I was trying to meet you halfway. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, so you know not of what. Of yes, what, what is this episode okay. about? This episode is about the Tesla Cybertruck. Oh, um, I have seen some circulating. there. Oh, you have on the road? Yes. Okay, um, what do you think? Mm. Well, first of all, let me, let me explain. Well, we'll have exp we will already have explained in the, in the actual intro. intro what's going on. So you've seen them on the road. I've seen them on the road. They are striking. Mm -hmm. They attract a lot of attention. Yeah. Uh, I saw someone who went to, and saw one at like a Cars and Coffee and of course did the thing that everyone does to a new Tesla, which is walk around and post pictures of the terrible panel gaps and fit. <sighs> uh, <laughs> Tesla Model Y is the number one selling car on the fucking planet. Like, yeah, I, I, consumers don't consumers give a shit. Consumers don't care. Like this car people care, but consumers eh, don't. I'd still have a Model Y. I don't give a shit. I mean, it's nice to have a Golf with perfect build quality, but you know, it goes a hundred miles. Yes. Be nice. Does zero to 60 in two days. You know, like I, would I, if, if Tesla made a golf size vehicle, would I have one? Of course. Would it I'd be? I'd buy a Polester first. No, not without that charging network. Mm. I mean, you have the garbage charging network and you bought that instead. In the, in I the only, golf. I need that car as a dinghy, right? I mean, I mean that's I mean, what I would use the, an EV for because we both have multiple, a variety of other options with yeah. Yeah, less range me. constraint. It's true. Um, but okay. So anyway, so I had a really amazing opportunity. Tesla, uh, gave me basically unlimited background information on the truck to do an icons episode on it. Mm -hmm. Um, which, and if, if we manage to get this out in time, you are watching this on Friday, the 1st of December, mm -hmm. which is the day that the embargo is lifting. Yeah. Is that right? So I have been told things are subject to change, but I have been told that, uh, Friday, uh, Friday, December 1st will be the embargo day and I can talk about that. And so right now live should be uh, the icons episode. Wow, you blasted it out that fast. Uh, thank you for Did anyone reaction. survive? No. <laughs> Everyone is dead. <laughs> you dead. have to get a new production team because everybody <laughs> died as a result of your... Uh, you literally Jake, Jake is over there shaking and drooling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why the edits were so hinged in the 9-11 uh, episode because so, Jake hadn't slept in a week. Yeah, I mean, look, the... Uh, Typically, I don't know if I want to admit this publicly, but typically an Icons episode is four to eight weeks of pre-production planning. Um, and that includes writing scripts and research and whatever, blah, blah, blah. Logistics. And logistics. And, you know, typically we have 12, 13, 14 vehicles um, in the show plus support vehicles. And then it's four days of filming, four and a half days of filming to get every shot exactly the way we want it. And then it's four to eight weeks in post i.e. editing and fact double fact checking and everything. on december 1st we are two weeks 
post the end of the shoot. Is that right? Yes. You shot it the uh, week Thanksgiving before Thanksgiving. In the middle. Yes. Holy shit. Yeah. So we had days to set it up. We had a day and three quarters to film. And by the way, they're the shortest days of the year because we're coming into the winter solstice. Um, and it rained. Um, Not as much as previ- thank, previewed. Thank God, because it would have been an underwater review. Um, and, uh, yeah, and we have, a, I mean, the, the posts, it's all so truncated that if you guys watch the icons episode and see the difference, this is the difference that that extra time makes. I mean, it's fun. It's great. We got some great supporting vehicles. Uh, you know me that I'm never going to say, well, let's just get all of its competitive set. I'm going to go tell a crazier story. Um, so of course I had the only other ever stainless steel, uh, production DeLorean. yep but it's not why it was there i mean there are so many similarities between the delorean and the and the cybertruck do you that have nothing to do with the stainless oh i like this the hard drive light is on uh, well, now there's smoke coming yeah, out and there's a little spinny wheel um megalomaniacal whack jobs at the helm i managed to not say that in the video really um, yeah that is one of them um, one of the similarities, the other one is four years almost to the month oh. or it's almost to the day act, between delay. debut and production start. Um, Immense delay. The, uh, the next one was a car that was shown to the public as a, ta-da, here's a car that was literally just a, a styling exercise mm. that had to then be engineered from the outside in, mm. mm-hmm. in the case of the Cybertruck tri- truck twice, by the way. I'll tell more about that later. Um, and that, that went on sale with double the price that it was estimated to be. <laughs> so the DeLorean was, uh, DMC 12 was the original name for $12,000. And by the time it finally went on sale, it was over twenty five. dollars To be fair, that was a period of extreme inflation. And to be fair, that is also Now is a period of extreme of inflation. And also, let me let me point out, because there's this truck is going to get so much fucking hate. Um, some of it deserve it, some of it not. Um, this is the top spec. It's a triple motor top spec that's going on sale. Um, it is not the base rear wheel drive. They think that MVP stands for maximum viable product instead of minimum viable yeah. product. <laughs> well, no, it's a smart way of doing it, right? If you can- Yes, if you because can, then you can backfill underneath and, well, of course. and the people who are most excited are gonna have the deepest pockets and go first. At the beginning, at but the also beginning. you need to, you you know, they've, they've put billions of dollars in. So they need to recover that as quickly as possible. Mm. So what better way to do it than to make the most expensive variants first and then trickle in the the lesser variants. Which is the opposite production. of what happened with the Bronco. And so the Bronco Sport came out and you're like, oh, this is kind of dumb and rental car And then the actual Bronco came out afterwards. But this is the right way to do it. This is how Tesla's always done it. I yes, mean, I mean, the Roadster to be their first product to make a sexy electric right. vehicle instead of a golf cart. Was, and then, you know, there was originally supposed to be a $40,000 Model S that never happens. And there was originally supposed to be a, you know, $30,000, whatever it was. They're always promising the, the cheaper models to come. Now, in the case of Tesla at the, at the moment, you hats off to them because they're dropping the prices of everything all the time. And their margins are still ahead of tip per in terms of profit per car, still at the same time, ahead. the market's coming up and average vehicle prices are going up too. Yeah. And so what used to be $35,000, which I think was the original promise for the three is now 45 or $50,000. And so it's not as, it, you know, well, but then, you know, they've lopped the $40,000 off the price of a plaid. Mm-hmm. 40 grand. Yeah. And I they, you know, that, 10 or 15 off the base, uh, the price of uh, like a long range model Y, like it's, they're getting genuinely comparable to an internal combustion engine in terms of prices. So I think we'll see the same with Cybertruck, but at the end of the day, it's a very expensive product to build because of how it goes. Okay, let's back up. Four years ago, we saw the Cybertruck concept. Mm -hmm. The story behind this was um, Elon's kid asked him why, this is the story that I was told that we've read elsewhere. Elon's kid asked him why the future doesn't look like the future, Mm. which got him thinking if he was gonna do a pickup truck, why should it be? like every other pickup truck. And doing research for this, it it was unbelievable to look at the frame from a 1940-something Ford F100 and the frame from a 2023 Ford F150. Ladder frames. You can genuinely barely tell them apart. Yeah. Like... There's yeah, probably the some engineer somewhere in Detroit being like, mur, mur, mur. they are. Look, I love a truck. Give me a Raptor. Like, I, you know, I, I, I love them, but at the end of the day, these are 70, 80, 100 year old cars underneath, right? There, there is nothing built as antiquatedly yes. as a pickup truck. And um, there's reasons for that, presumably. It's cheap and tough. 
Yes, and like you want this, the bed to be removable so you can put other things on the back of it. You also want to size up. You don't want unitary construction because if it's flexing as the result of towing things or loading the bed, you want there to be a gap between the, the right. cab and the bed so that, you know, there's space to absorb for, that. For stuff to move That's around. That's why a Honda yeah. Ridgeline carries much less than, because yeah. it's unitary construction exactly. than a real truck. But there, you know, and the things that are, the, the things you really benefit from by unitized construction and modern construction methods aren't really important to trucks. Handling, NVH. I mean, when you, when you have a 130 inch weight. wheelbase, weight. Yeah. Um, so, so, but Elon was sort of started thinking about if I had to design a pickup truck for, from scratch that looked like the future, what would it look like? And so apparently he and Franz von Holthausen started, started working together on it. And Franz had sketched this like moon rover looking thing. And Elon said, great, build it. And gave the team 90 days from the time he said that. And well, look, I'm, okay. Yes, you be the you be the anti Elon guy, and I can be the pro Elon guy for this one because I can definitely see both sides of this. But the team had ninety days to put that pile of shit together, and they did, and they put it on stage, and we all saw the the softball throw that broke the glass when the glass was supposed to be bulletproof. Oh my fucking god! <laughs> oh man, um, was that four years ago? That was four years ago. That was twenty nineteen. No, yeah, that was November of twenty nineteen. That he broke the window. Uh huh. I thought, really? Yeah. Time flies when you're old. Fuck. <laughs> um, and by the way, the reason it broke, this is this was interesting because of course I had un unfiltered access to the engineers and hope I don't get myself in trouble for this. Or but them. Or they'll them be dead. Trouble. No. Then it, how it was are you going to get the scoop on the next? Well, they'll, when, listen, when I, listen, he who shall not be named find, finds out, then they shall die. He knows. Look, they, okay. they, he knows why it broke. What, the reason the, the window broke is because they stress tested it behind the stage. Remember, they had 90 days to build it. They took 93, they, apparently 93 days from the time they saw that sketch to had to build the thing. And this the, is like the pickle jar. I loosened it. It was, they, well, you were able to get the lid it. off because I loosened it. They tested it. It didn't break. Testing it put a bunch of micro cracks in it. And so when yeah, on it's stage, a pickle it jar. Broke, yeah. So that's kind of funny. So, of course, we all Why laughed. Why didn't they do it with the passenger mirror? I mean, door, window, whatever the I fuck. I think they did. Well, they did front and rear. Whatever the fuck. I think it's funny. We all laughed at it. We all had a good laugh at it. But the problem Except is it set Elon the stage. didn't have a good laugh. He laughed on stage. Yeah, but that actually, that laugh meant that three people died. I, okay, none of the people who were on stage that day are dead. So maybe he's not as evil as you think he is. Um, I'm going to start watching my words lest I go. No, no. But the whole thing was a PR catastrophe. And throughout the development of this truck, Tesla's gotten a lot of shit. Like, I'm not saying Tesla and Elon in particular doesn't bring on some of its own shit. Like, doesn't ask for the shit. Mm, Falcon doors, perhaps. Anyway, continue. This is this was actually something that made it into the video. So I was in a... a, a private sort of couple journalists and Elon meeting years ago at the debut of the Model X. And he said, flat out, if I had known what this was going to take, I would have never done the Falcon doors, the monopost seats, or that glass roof. Next car is going to be conventional. And the Model Y is conventional. And it outsells Model X 25 to 1, so or more. Um, so they should have learned. But when you have... I asked the chief of development, if his job was actually to take the musings of a lunatic, of a lunatic genius man child and turn them into reality. And he just burst out laughing. That's their job. This is like Frank Gehry. Frank Gehry is the architect who designed the Disney concert hall mm -hmm. and that museum in Bilbao, Spain, that looks like somebody crumpled up some of aluminum foil and then handed it to an engineer. And it's like, okay, build it and make it not right. fall down. And you're just like, uh, how do I do this as an engineer? It's that sort of challenge that has made some of the world's most amazing things. You can't, can you imagine the person who is like, the emperor who is like, I want, I don't know, um, a tall triangular shaped building made out of blocks, each big enough to like crush a skyscraper. Oh yeah, let's make the fucking pyramids. Like mm -hmm. if, if it weren't for people having well, outrageous dreams. He had slaves. So does Elon. They're yes. employees, but they're, okay. So whatever, for whatever reason, he decides to reinvent the wheel or reinvent the pickup truck, right, in this case. So they, they put it on stage. Despite the fiasco, they, the order started pouring in. Now, I don't, I'm sure it was originally intended for, intended for production. 
But I don't think anyone would have guessed that they would have a million orders for this truck. That's a million people. What were they them. secured with? They were $100. Mm. Refundable? Refundable. But mm-hmm. How many people could you get to give you 100, 100 bucks? Refundable or not? A lot fewer than that. Right. That's my point. Like a million people plunked down a hundred bucks, which is, by the way, a nice loan to Tesla for the development of this. Of yes, this yes. That's always the yeah. mechanism that these so, startups use. Yeah. So a long story short, everyone goes to work on this truck. They spend two years there engineering the truck based on that. Uh, the, the truck on the show stands are not really allowed to change anything about the way it looks, uh, which presented huge engineering challenges, both in terms of the uh, stainless steel uh, uh, construction, this quote unquote exoskeleton structure that had never been done before in a car, um, but also just aerodynamics, right? Which are the most important thing on an electric vehicle. So they get done and Elon takes the first drivable prototype home and decrees it too big. Can't fit in the driveway, can't fit in the garage, whatever. It was just too big. Um, so they had to throw it out and start over. I mean, it's never fully thrown out, but they had to take the same brief and put it in a much smaller package. How much did they scale it down? Overall 5%. Um, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I think like width was 3%, length was 7%. It averages out to be about five overall, but they didn't just select all and times 0.095, right? Um, because they had packaging constraints and had other engineering constraints and like the wheels aren't gonna change size and the motors aren't gonna change size and the interior can't shrink. So they basically started over. Um, and uh, I think the reason that I got the access that I did is because they just want someone to know what the fuck they've been doing for the last four years and tell, not someone, they want the world to know. They haven't been dicking around. They've been getting beat up left and right by the public about fingerprints and panel gaps and this, you know, the, the look dense. of this whole thing, dense and all this other shit and the broken windows. What they did in the background is nothing short of, I don't want to say an engineering miracle, but I think the Tesla advances the art of the, the, the Cybertruck advances the art of the truck m- far more than Model S advanced the art of the automobile. And that is... Well, to in, be fair, the, uh, the truck started in 1644 and the car was squarely in like 1998. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the truck had a lot further to come. Yes. But with a shape like that, a shape and that the stainless and all the rest of this, the sort of excitement around this. Tesla didn't have to do anything. All they had to do was shit this out. Is it meaningfully more useful than a Rivian R1T? And if you treat that as the, the, well, I, you know, you, when you keep referring to a ladder framed, you know, heavy duty truck. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, can the cyber truck, should the cyber truck be compared to those things or should it be compared to something like a Ridgeline or an R1T? where it's like sort of truck like but not that uh, not useful and not really a substitute for a heavy duty truck okay. thing. So definitely not compared to a Ridgeline. Um so first of all I need to qualify all of these statements, but let me say a Ridgeline is not even in the running here. An R1T is like a Ridgeline in in terms of its construction style, its unitary construction. Uh the way I phrased it in the script was Rivian basically took the idea and the traditional shape of a pickup truck and then used modern construction methods and the best of everything, I should say. Best suspension design, best con- chassis construction, best of best sort of best practices of the industry to create a phenomenal consumer product that has huge amount of storage, great, great construction. It's really strong. It does everything well, and I, I really love it. Tesla didn't go a step further. Tesla threw everything out and started completely over. And... So when you ask about usability, can it tow more? Yes. So it tows more, it's faster, it's more efficient. It is more of all of these different metrics. Where it it doesn't meet the Rivian, to me, visually, is the shape. Look, I don't love the way it looks, right? There are times I look at it and I'm like, wow, holy shit, that's so fucking like extra in a good way. And then other times I'm like, this thing is horrid to look at. It's, you know, the the whole camera crew was laughing the whole time that we were filming it because they said it just looked like an empty space in the frame, like some sort of digital render error where the a camera void. couldn't pick it up, a void. <laughs> um, and then, you know, when you see it static, it's like this fucking thing is incredible looking. But is it pretty? I, I don't know. I really it's genuinely go back and forth. It's not supposed to be. Right. But there's no rear visibility. So, for example, when the tonneau covers down uh, or up, I should say, when it's 
extended, which by the way, you can jump up and down on it. It holds 300 pounds. Um, that totally blocks your rear vision. So the truck comes with a rear view mirror, but it, it allows you to get rid of it because you can't really use it anyway. And there's a digital rear view camera in the screen. I don't think that's better than being able to see out of a mirror. I don't think it's a better solution. Um, and you can drive with the tonneau not there, but then you lose 10% of your range. Okay. Um, but for example, let me get back to let me get back to how it outperforms everything in every way by starting to talk about what it is structurally. So the idea here was to use uh, a stainless steel exterior that was part of the structure. Now, Isn't this just what unitary construction is? No, no. So unitary construction, kind of, <laughs> not no, kind of. <laughs> but unitary construction is that the the body itself is the Every, the chassis is the body, right? The body is for, is part of everything. But the exterior surfaces that you see are not structural, typically, right? So maybe a rear quarter has a little bit of structure to it. But the idea on this one was the outside skin is the structure, period. So it's not like a fender is bolted on. No, that fender becomes part of the structure. Um, so they're I telling me I would love this. to see what happens when you get a fender bender because it becomes a chassis bender. Wait, I have, I have that. You haven't seen the video yet. So, no. and I purposely didn't do that. So they're telling me this and I'm like, okay. And they're like, so for example, we don't have to have side impact door beams. And I'm like, excuse, what? And they're like, the steel is so strong. The skin, the outer skin is that there's no inner door structure. And so normally we have inner uh, a door and that steel is, you could bend it with your fingers. I mean, you yeah. could put, push your thumb into it and make a ding. Um, you can twist anything, you know, on, on a door. And they're like, no, 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 it's that strong. And I, I, was, I genuinely was scared. I'm like, what, what do you, so, no side impact door beams. Like, why would you do this? What happens if you get hit with a Ram truck? They're like, yeah, it'll just bounce off. And I'm, I, I genuinely thought they were fucking crazy. So I go and see the way this thing is built. And the front and rear are both the largest aluminum castings ever in the history of the automobile. And there's massive, massive aluminum castings that look so strong that they could probably support an entire apartment building. Fair enough. Um, and then they hand me a piece of HFS. And this is HFS, which stands for hard fucking steel, literally, because Tesla is Tesla. And this is what the doors are made out of. Um, and this is a new alloy that that Tesla created because their choice was either corrosion resistance or heavyweight. And they could they wanted lightweight and corrosion resistance and strength. Um, so careful, these are really sharp, but these they gave me these. This is a model S. Uh, I'm sorry, a model Y door. And yeah, this is it's, conventional. This is it's like conventional, what a car but it's pretty would strong. Be made of. Right. Yeah. I mean, the, all the ship boxes that I drive are nowhere near that strong. Um, so you can I mean, yeah, you, that's a lot thicker. That's like at least two or three times as thick. Okay. But so you can, I mean, for the flex people it, who can, yes. you can easily flex that, crease it, bend it, fuck it up. I mean, ruin it. It's there for this purpose. Yeah, you've now ruined it. Okay. This is what Well, the, it's bigger. Do I want the same size piece. I don't have the same size piece. Do, <laughs> do, just watch it sharp. But I mean, put it up against the wall and curb stomp it. Yeah, that's what I want to do. So this little bend that I put in it, was I put it up against a, a wall and the floor triangulated and hit it with a 20 pound dead blow sledgehammer three times and finally got it to bend like that. So this is the stuff that they said is bulletproof. And they showed, you know, you've, they showed me pictures of it. We saw the, the truck that they'd been, sh they shot with like a nine millimeter and all these other different guns and it's bulletproof. But I was like, okay, yeah, whatever. But I, nothing prepared me for that. Like you can hit, and we did in the video, hit the door with a 20 pound <sighs> dead blow sledgehammer repeatedly didn't make a dent so i mean oh just ended the table marred the table yeah. <laughs> i mean the whole skin is out of this and so i was still i was still like okay that's pretty cool and then they so took how do me you handle crash crash lab. they took me to the crash lab how do you absorb energy if it won't yield it, well, it does yield. It doesn't, it's just not going to yield to a shopping cart. It's going to yield to huge forces. So they- Like getting hit by an F-350. Right. 
So they, we were there for in their crash form in a sort of conventional mm-hmm. fashion uh, in a R- crash ripples. environment. Mm-hmm. This is in the video. We we were there. We filmed it. So the Cybertruck is stationary. There's a sled that's coming down at 33 and a half miles an hour, and the sled weighs 1,400 kilos, 3,100 pounds. So this is a Civic. Which is a lot less than most cars. Civic. Now. Civic with a passenger in it, because Civics are 2,900 pounds, um, at 33 and a half miles an hour into the door. Now, every other car you ever see crash tested, the B pillar is buckled in. I mean, the passengers are, you know, shoved to the side rather violently. It's a huge crash, mm-hmm. huge crash, fatal in any of our old cars. How much does this thing weigh? Six, I weighed it 66 something. It's pretty light. 67 something. Very light because they, I mean, if you think of light in terms, it's this, it's lighter. It's less than a Rivian. It's Rivian less, is like 7,100. It was, I, I, I had a Rivian R1T there, four motor, and I weighed them both, and it was 60 pounds less than the Rivian. 60 pounds. It was also 2,599 pounds less than, than a Hummer, Hummer. EV. Yeah. Um, and it's less than a Dodge Ram. So anyway, um, this sled hits this fucking thing, and you'd normally expect massive deformation. The one window broke. <laughs> The, because they're not, by the way, bulletproof windows, which is stupid to say the truck's bulletproof when the windows are, are not, but they are Gorilla Glass. But uh, the doors buckled and they just opened normally and there was no deformation of the V pillar at all. Car could have two new doors, new airbag, new, uh, you know, side impact airbags and some trim and it would have been back on the road from a crash that would have killed anyone in a car from 20 years ago. Like it's just <sighs> staggering. Um, but this is Tesla when it comes to crash. So what happens if the whole front of the thing is one casting, if you get a, it, if it gets damaged, then what happens? I mean, you have to replace the whole front of it or it's, you replace the whole sub vehicle frames. Are there's, there subframes? Yeah, there are subframes, but there are, I mean, you're, so sp- that's a very large, presumably expensive part. I don't think it would be replaceable. I think if you broke, for example, a shock tower, I don't know if it can. Yeah. Be but if in. you like. But I, I also, also if say, you hit someone at 15 miles an hour, or 20 miles oh, an hour. Oh, you're not going to break anything on this thing. The, you're not going to damage the sheet metal? No, no, no. There's a sacrificial crash. First of all, there's a sacrificial crash structure, right? That's obvious. That's going to be part of it. Um, and that's replaceable. But then the body panels are affixed. They're structural, but they're still affixed. They're not permanent. So it's not so like they're welded on. you could swap it off. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So they're like a front fender is sounds removable. a lot like a conventional monocoque construction. But the, in the conventional monocoque construction, this what you, the steel that you see on the outside it's not is structural. not structural. There's a structure behind it. So you pull yes, a fender yes, off yes. and there's something approximating the same shape. Yeah, yeah. But why do that? That's their idea, right? If you, can, if you have the, uh, a surface that you can make that strong, do it that way. And then you don't have the waste of an interior surface and an exterior Bulkheads, surface. Yeah. yeah. So look, listen, I'm not going to tell you what I think is necessary and what's not i'm telling you what i think is different is this necessary for the truck world i don't know but the idea was this needs to be indestructible so i think it has like 17 inches of ground clearance in in its highest mode um air shocks at all four corners obviously height adjustable it's got a locking front diff um because one one motor in the front two in the back so it's got a locking diff in the front and then the two in the rear are electronically locked together so they do the same thing at the same time um And you have, so like all the suspension components are fucking enormous. So is this intended for off-road use? It's intended to do everything. So, right. So now we have the toughness part. You have the chassis is like the body of the car is bulletproof. uh, Effectively, you're not going to get door dings. You're not going to hurt the thing in a, and you're not going to get hurt in it in a crash. They obviously, I didn't see a front, front impact. Um, But I, Tesla's broken. They literally broke the crash test. I don't know if you remember this, but the Model S broke the rig that was supposed to crush the roof for roof crush stra- crash test because the roof was stronger than the machine. So, ta-da. Then the Model S got 5.4 stars on a 5.0 scale so that it broke the test. Then the Model X broke the rollover test because they couldn't literally could not get the thing to roll over, period. 
And then the Model 3 outperformed both of those cars when on its crash test, and the Model Y outperformed that. So test the four safest cars in the world ever made are Teslas, basically. And now this thing comes out. So I don't, you know, everyone's like, well, the, the, this is going to turn into a guillotine. I, sure, let's, let's wait and see. My money's on Tesla's crash safety in, in the real world. Then, so then you have the the chassis, the the extrusions. Like they had, they had a lab that I walked through. It's like a torture lab where they're doing durability testing, mm -hmm. and it was unbelievable walking past this one machine that was simulating a five G impact to a, a curb, um, and you could watch five the geez. yeah, you watch the <laughs> suspension, the tower just bend and bend and bend, and this is like inch thick aluminum. And you're like, how the aluminum doesn't bend, it breaks. It was just insane to watch this. And they're like, yeah, that's already racked up like 160,000 miles of 5G impacts. Bang, bang, bang. I mean, the durability stuff was nuts. Um, and then so, so right, you have this chassis and that's never been done before, an exoskeleton. They, you know, this unpainted stainless, part of the look, whatever. Then they attacked the electrical architecture. And this is where it gets really wild. So Tesla's to this point have all been 400 volts. Um, which means they can't charge at 800 volt chargers. Well, they can, but you know, there's a, an interface issue. So what they did on this one is um, the battery pack is structural. So you have the front casting, the rear casting, and then the battery pack as the main structure of the vehicle and then the exoskeleton. The battery pack uses Tesla's own new 4680 battery. So instead of like a double A, they're like a bigger than a D cell. They're taller and bigger. Um, and the way they arranged it is there are four uh, 200 volt units, effectively packlets, little battery packs. Um, and they're arranged in parallel for 800 volt operation for all three motors. But to be backwards compatible with all the other old 400 volt chargers, there's a switch in there that's the coolest thing in the world that takes them from all of them in series to two in parallel and two, to two in series. So now you can charge at 350 kilowatts or whatever the, the max output is, two batteries at the same time, hmm. which is another like poof why didn't anyone else think of this mm -hmm. um like for example lucid when you're trying to charge a lucid on a 400 volt charger it has, has to go through the wonder box which means it's limited to 50 kilowatts well not a problem here um so obviously the whole idea of voltage of higher voltage is lower current so your quick and dirty electrical engineering classes if you have a load of let's say one kilowatt um and it, your your power which is we measure in watts, is volts times amps. So if you double the voltage, you cut the amperage in half, meaning the current, and that means you can effectively, near as makes no difference, half the amount of wiring. So that- V equals IR. Yes, so the, I, the idea there is the higher the voltage of the system, the, the more current you can run through it with smaller wires. Um, so this is the 800 volt swap. This is why we have transformer stations. Right, well, this is why our big electrical consumers in the house run on 240 volts instead of our 120, right? Uh, but Tesla did something else that no one has ever done before. The entire electrical architecture of the car is 48 volts. There's no 12 volt subsystem. Huh. I was like, okay, so they, they got me with the chassis thing. I'm like, oh yeah, it's really interesting. And then the 48 volt thing started. And I was like, wait, what? And you know that probably that the OEMs have been trying to go to 48 volts for 30 years. This has been a constant like, oh, we're going to go to 48 volt, but then it never happens. And the reasons are car companies don't make any, any parts anymore. They buy parts from suppliers. The car companies are all tepid about this. Like, oh, we'd like to go to 48 volt, but, 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 but the suppliers aren't going to do anything until the car companies make them. The car companies aren't going to make the suppliers do it until everyone else does it. And it's just became, became, be, became this ridiculous waiting game where for 30 years, everyone's talking about 48. Why do they volt. want to go directly to 48 instead of 24? Because the electrical needs of cars have gone so through the roof. So the last change, by the way, was six to 12 in 1955 ish. Um, and so, you know, the, the current, the current needs and I, I, the wiring needs dropped by about a half when they went from six to 12 volts and it's been 70 years. Think about the electrical needs of a 70 year old car. Like go again in a 1955 Plymouth Fury, if there such a thing exists, and um, and turn on the headlights. Okay, you're done, right? That's it. Wipers. Wipers, maybe a 300 watt heater fan. And now you compare that to a modern car. Push button radio. That uses 0.2 watts. I mean- No heated rear screen. 
Well, the point there is, think about it now. When you have a screen that's the full width of the car, yes, yes. the car will run, some like BMWs will pull 90 or 100 amps sitting still doing nothing. There's that much computing power happening in the car. Then you have how many climate control fans? Uh, you have fans on heat sinks on the LEDs. You have the entire electrical propulsion system, <laughs> right? You have electric power steering. Mm -hmm. Those are like, you know, a kilowatt or two. So the, the needs are just exponent and needs for current have been growing exponentially. And that means of course the needs for wiring have to. Um, so Tesla just said, fuck this, we're done. And literally I love this showed me, sent me a copy of the document that I'm under NDA and not allowed to share, but I can say it's called how to engineer a 48 volt vehicle. They wrote a PDF and sent it to the CEO of every other car company and all the suppliers. And they're like, the, the point being like, <laughs> fuck you, like enough, enough shit or get off the pot. If you're not gonna do your homework, we're doing it. Um, and it was, it's, I read it, it's very simple, but it's a bunch of learnings about like, okay, this is best practice, this is best practice. We found this, we found this, we found this. Go forth and do it, but we're doing our own shit. And they basically said, we're, we're done waiting and we're sick of suppliers not doing this. So we're just making 48 volt everything, catch up. How do you use your Valentine one? There are USB ports. I don't believe there's a lighter port. Um, there are, what, there's a 110 outlet. There's a 240 outlet in the back of it. I mean, um, but there are USBs. I didn't. Uh, yeah, I want to know how to use the Valentine one. That's important. I'm going to say Did this they one's sponsor on, this episode. They, I don't think so. There's a chance that Valentine <laughs> one might be sponsoring. Uh, this, this, Valentine one sponsors Cooter and the ultimate drag race we play. And you and I both have V ones have for years. Um, I won't road trip without my V one, but I'm going to say this. It's not Tesla's fault that Valentine one is relying on a 12 volt lighter socket. The V one Gen two should be running on a USB. Sorry. Um, which is five volts and or five or 13, whatever the fuck it is. Um, so yeah, so the whole thing is 48 volts. The primary beneficiary of that 48 volt, well, for, hold on, here's the other thing. They threw out the entire way every other car is wired. So they did this a couple years ago with Model 3 and no one really, I think it was 3 or Y, no one really talked about it. No more fuses. Mm. And I'm like, how did, how did no one know this? Think about it. Imagine you open six tabs of Pornhub at the same time on your phone and you pop a fuse. Like you overload the processor and you pop. What fucking year is this? Like that is the most idiotic thing I've ever heard. Well, why the fuck should our cars, which are by the way, all computers on wheels, have fuses? Yeah. Because you're saying you just monitor the system and then shut it, shut the circuit down. down. Yeah. yeah, and so Model Three got rid of, I think it was three. If, it could have been why. Got rid of all the fuses and they're just, you know, it's just IC circuits. Um, and so that was the first step. And the second step is now a totally different modular um, wiring network. So the fastest cans in cars right now apparently run at 500 megabit, um, 50 megabit, five meg shit. I don't remember. Real slow. Uh, Tesla designed a gigabit can for the car. So it's order of magnitude uh, faster. Um, it can't be 500 megabit because gigabit would only be twice as fast. It's 20 times as fast. So it's 50, whatever. Huge increase in can speed. Um, and then decided to stop. Control area network. This is the car's yes. computer system. Yeah, the, all of the computers that run everything. But rather than having wires go from one place across the car to the other one, they just decided they would have I think it's a total of five or six modules um, that talk to the everything that's closest. But because everything can run over can, for example, imagine, think about this, but the best way to think about it is a stereo. You have a stereo, you have a head unit up front and you have speakers, like 21 speakers all around the cars. Well, in typically, and the way a car would work is that you would have to have a wire that would go from the head unit to the amplifier and then to a, a separate wire that would go to each one of those speakers. Well, if everything's run over the can, you don't. You just have a power support, a support and a can wire to everything in the car. So power supply, can. Just like every other fucking device. Do you think there's a wire connecting everything in this phone? Like, no. So they're just basically leaping the car into next or last century um, stuff. So all of these enormous cross, like you've seen car wiring harnesses that yes, are yes. like an inch thick and it's like 200 wires and they're all wrapped around and each one of them could break and there's a problem with them and then it would pop a fuse or whatever, replaced with this little tiny ribbon 
<laughs> and they reduced cross, I think the, the number was 77%, reduced the number of cross car cabling by 70 something percent and reduced the total number of copper by over half. <laughs> wow. Ta-da, done. Okay, so now that speaker just listens to the can and says, okay, this is what I need to be playing. That one does that. Oh, the door lock needs to talk to the window switch activator, which needs to talk to whatever. They just do it all over the can, which is genius. So I'm like, okay. And they're like, this leads to weight savings. And of course you look at the thing and you're like, it's gotta weigh a million pounds. No, it doesn't. The primary beneficiary of the 48 volt is steering because this is the world's first fully steer by wire vehicle. Holy shit. Yeah. There is no physical connection, no backup connection, no physical connection between the steering wheel and the front wheels or the rear wheels because they steer also. <sighs> so what there is, is a steering rack that of course they built with a supplier together with a supplier with two one and a half kilowatt motors on it. So double pinion, two motors, um, one on the back, um, one motor for the, for the rear rack and two on the front. The rear is currently limited to, I, I want to say it was three degrees of steering, but they're doing a software update that'll bump it up to 10. They're just working on, apparently on some issues with it. Um, the only thing the steering wheel is connected to is a little force feedback unit. So very much like a, your Citroen, when the car is turned off, you turn the wheel all the way, nothing happens outside though. And the wheel goes back because it's a video game controller effectively. Uh -huh. um, and the force back feedback unit is there, not for, not necessarily for like road texture, even though you do get some, it's more- You get road texture? You do. How? Because it's measuring everything at the rack. There are sensors everywhere that are measuring what's at the rack and it knows what is, bump and vibration and steering wheel out of balance and it knows what's what's a real force on the rack um in the same way that e-pass does the electric conventional electric power steering is you there's a physical connection but it's but it's assisted with electric motors and they're they are actively canceling out some stuff like road crown pull or like a crosswind pull um and then amplifying other things that it feels that it realizes you want to feel. And that's why electric power steering has gotten a lot better over the last 10 years it's because car companies have ma uh, made strides in how do we give some feedback to the driver? The stuff um, you want. The stuff you want. And it's not great. Um, neither is this. This is not a sports car though. It's a truck. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the force feedback unit, for example, will stop. If you're turning your, your wheel into a curb, right? And the tire hits a curb, you don't want the driver to not know. You know, like, and just rip the tire off the wheel. So it will kind of push back on you. Um, it's as fast as you could ever turn the wheel or faster. So there's none of that. This is the way Airbus, well, air, all airplanes generally. Thank you. 1988. Yeah. Airbus A320 was the first commercial airline to go fully fly by, fly wire. by wire. Same year that the BMW 750 IL went fully throttle by wire. Mm -hmm. um, and this was happening in military airplanes sooner. And Boeing came around to it in the 90s, 90s. Two probably with the seven seven seven. It's a scary concept. It's a scary concept that you know you're at the mercy of a computer for your steering. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we've been at the mercy of the computer for throttle for twenty five years, and we've years. all been flying around in airplanes that do this for many years too. We are at the mercy of computers and for elevators. Thirty five years. We're in the mercy of computers all the time, and we don't think twice about it. Um, the I'm not worried about the steering at all. I mean, Infinity had. So Lexus is working on it. A bunch of uh, journalists have driven a prototype uh, with steer by wire. Infinity did it in 2016 or 2017 uh, in the Q50 Red Sport 400 Q60, Red Sport 400, which is the twin turbo thing. And it, but there was a physical connection there and there was a clutch. Um, and when the system was happy with everything going on, it would disengage the clutch. So there was no connection, but they needed a backup connection just in case. Tesla didn't do that. Uh, Tesla just has redundant sensors everywhere. So it has triple redundant sensors for anything important. So if two, if one disagrees, it'll use the other two rather than, because if you only have two sensors, you don't know which one's right. Yeah. Airplanes do this. Airbuses do this too. They call it going into alternate law and direct right. law. And, yep. So that's a mind fuck because the steering wheel can only possibly be turned it's 170 degrees in each direction, 340 degrees. So it's degrees. like, yeah, so it's uh, one, turn. one turn lock to lock. And at one turn lock to lock. Does it change the ratio based on the speed? Yep. yep. So you, the car's not nervous at speed. It is, so the first time I drove it, so I drove a prototype in the Tesla lot. What is the maximum deflection that allow at speed? Does it tune, does it reduce the amount of deflection you, like if you crank the wheel hard over at 
a hundred miles an hour, is it going to give you a num- different number of degrees of deflection oh, really? than it would at five miles I an hour? I can't imagine it would. I mean, driver request. I can't imagine they would have done it. It's going to give you what you want. But it's got stability control on, so it's just you know it's just going to do everything to not. I just feel like there's a problem like that. I remember this in the the first. US WRX STI model year 04, like it was very nervous because, mm-hmm. or like in a Julia, the steering is so fast that on center, like these things that normally would become sort of background vibrations at speed, then suddenly become like sort of large inputs right. that are unsettling because it's a direct, I guess, ratio instead yeah. of. Yeah. So the, the trick here is that it can be varied infinitely, right? From mm-hmm. slow to fast. And I so, I was asking if it changes at oh yeah. speed versus speed. Oh, yeah, at low very speed. much so. Because so the first time I drove it was in a parking lot. And actually, that was a mistake. I should have driven it in normal speeds first because at normal speeds, it feels almost completely conventional. Um, there's at, at 60, 70, 80 miles an hour, it, you're effectively, I don't, I think it was 16 to one is the, the slowest ratio that it is. So it's fairly quick, but it's normal within the totally realm of normal. Yeah. When you slow way down in parking lots, that's when you're like, whoa, what the fuck? Because you go to you go to par- pull into a parking spot and you're thinking, for example, I just gotten out of a lightning, which I think is four turns lock to lock. And to go from four turns lock to lock to one to, and pull into the same parking spot, you know, you're expecting a hand over hand. And this is whoop. And you're at lock and the car, the truck is just there. Um, that was very disorienting at first. So what we did in the video to to evaluate this basically, cause I hadn't really driven this thing much before we started filming was we, we went to Sonoma Raceway to film because number one was private, we can lock off access. Um, so no onlookers and whatever else. Number two, Sonoma's local and beautiful. And also Sonoma's got everything you need, a drag, a, a racetrack, drag, drag race track, strip, drag, yeah. drag strip, go-kart track. How come you don't go to Sonoma more often? Cause it's too expensive. Yeah. Oh. Um, but they have a go-kart track. And of course, what do you think I did? I put the fucking cyber truck on the go-kart course. And the, you know, the guy who runs the go-kart course is like, this is never going to work. You're never going to be able to get around these corners. And I'm like, well, it's got the same turning race as model S. And he was like, no, no chance. And I'm like, okay, well, he's like, you're just gonna have to do a three point turn there. And the idea was that I had Randy following me in a go-kart, like an actual go-kart. Shifter cart. Uh, it was not a shifter. This one was uh, a single gear. But, you know, the go-karts don't stop all that well because they are they have Bank only rear brakes. Down the rear. Um, only so one we, brake. We did have quite a conversation, Randy and I, about like, Jason, don't get too hard on the brakes. And I'm like, he's like, I'm just going to be up your ass the whole time. And, and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to have to stop and make six point turns. Like, this is not going to, nope. So at the end, <laughs> at the end of, the, of, <laughs> of pit out is a hundred and, 70 degree U-turn basically. And they're like, no chance. First time through there, boom. I didn't even get to lock, <laughs> to full lock. I was like, ah, oh, okay. Rah! And then goodbye. Um, it was a riot. It was really funny. We had a lot of fun with the scene, but I was like, it was like driving. I hate even repeating this. The The driving dynamics target was Porsche 911. Elon wanted a pickup truck that drove like a Porsche 911. And you know, your reaction's got to be like, no, it's not fucking happening. Way closer to a 911 than any pickup truck that I've ever driven. I mean, it. I did get it on two wheels and normal times. It did. It was I mean, a little hairy. There's a big difference between a pickup truck and a 911. I mean, way closer. Like, so if you if you if you call a 911 a 10 and you call a pickup truck a zero, where is it? It's in sedan realm. It's in, like, I'm not going to say Taika. Well, it's faster than, that, that, we haven't gotten to the speed yet. It's the fastest fucking thing. I, I, I don't know why they didn't lead with this. 2.6 seconds to 60 on <laughs> mud tires. <laughs> and I, it was so bullshit. It, I, I called such bullshit because we had a, <laughs> we had a Rivian our four motor R1T and that's the fastest truck ever produced. They do three, one, three, two to 60. And so I'm on the phone with Rivian and I'm like, under NDA, so I can't tell them what I'm doing. And I'm like, it's against the truck that's from the cyber generation and it's new. And they're like, oh shit, what can we get you? I'm like, get me whatever you want, do whatever you want. I love your truck, but you, at the end of the day, you guys want to get, if you want to participate, give me what you got. Of course they sent a four motor on summer performance tires. And I thought, uh oh, cyber truck's gonna have a problem here and thought, okay. So we wrote, the, I wrote the script two ways, not knowing. And the first launch, I left the fucking Rivian for dead. Like dead, like 
I was like, what? Randy, Randy, did you not get on it? He was, that was full throttle. No way. Yeah, three, one to two, six, not even close. Mm. And then it was the craziest thing. So I called such bullshit that I'm like, this is like unfucking believe it's got to be the VHT because we're on a drag strip and it's got, you know, it's got glue on it, sticky surface. Went out on a totally conventional piece of asphalt, two, six. I mean, it's just no drama, 2.6 second. It does not have battery preconditioning necessary. There's no special mode you got to be in. You just flat foot it. Or in this case, if you both feed in, it does lower the rear. So you don't get the sort of Hummer-esque look, but it doesn't change the number of two, six. And by the way, 11 through the quarter mile. So we're running these quarter miles like over and over and over again. And for once we have like, we're normally you know, on a racetrack or airstrip or something. We have timing lights. And as I'm going through, I'm like, I'm watching these timing lights not change. It did 11 flats over and over and over and over and over again. And I just keep looking at the V-Box like, how the fuck is this thing not overheating and slowing down? By the time we got down to 30 something percent battery, and we only started out in the 70s. By the time we got to 30% battery, uh, it was 33% battery. It ran an 11.2 and changed, 2.8. So an 11.3. But the zero to 60 was still 2.6. Like it was just like, what the fuck? That's the benefit of the new batteries and the 800 volt architecture. So mm -hmm. I'm like, this is just like absolute unbelievable. Left the Hummer EV for dead, left the, it's just like the fastest pickup truck ever made by a huge margin, seven tenths of a second through the yeah. quarter mile. So you have that kind of speed with one turn lock to lock steering on a go-kart track with like stability control that doesn't really let you do go crazy, but doesn't really slow you down either. Um, I did put it in Baja mode and turn everything off. And that was when it got, it raises to full suspension height. And that's when we kept getting a little bit of ground below the tires. So we mm -hmm. cut that out really quickly. Um, but the thing is just like ridiculous. Then you get to the usability part of it. Like the interior's huge. It's nice, big, huge back seat. Um, it's nicely done. It's typical Tesla stuff. It's you know simple. The the touchscreen is fast and works beautifully. Now it it doesn't have a yoke, but it has the yoke with like a connected top, so it's a squircle steering wheel. But now you can use the turn signal things on it because you never ever have to cross hand over hand. Like um, a Ferrari. Like Ferrari, unlike Ferrari, which has the stupid buttons, but then you, you're you like, which yes, way am I going? Yes. Um, I'd still rather stocks. Like the car has no physical buttons and no stocks, and I still think that's a missed opportunity. Every time I got in the Rivian, I'm like, oh, look at this. I just go doop doop, and I'm in gear. How lovely. Um, But the, uh, the usability is like, the bed is fully secured. Once it's locked, you can't get in. You can stand on that tonneau cover. Um, how large is it? Is it useful? It is more, it fits a four by eight sheet of plywood with, but the tonneau, uh, the, the thing beds, the tailgate's tailgate. gotta be down. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's cargo carrying capacity. I don't, I, the, all the specs are going to come out. I don't remember. It's huge. Like it dwarfs. It's everything in all of the specs. It's basically like the heavy duty pickup stuff. And then, you know, the H, the real HD, like the F-350s and whatever crucify this. But like towing, I think is 11,000 pounds. Um, it's 2,500 pounds payload, 3,500 pounds payload, way more than anything else you'd expect in that, you know, in this thing. And then it does zero to 16, 2.6 seconds. Oh, and then it's literally twice as efficient as the Hummer. Well, wow. So it has, th they were, they're expecting over 310 miles of range. Um, out of 123 kilowatt hour battery pack. That's barely bigger than like a Model S. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's the efficiency came in all the wiring, the high voltage, and then aero. And they did crazy shit on aero. Is it aerodynamic? Does it have a C sub D that we know? It's, yeah, it's 335, 0 0.335. Okay. Which is, so Rivian's leading it, 0.30. Um, Rivian's, wow. yeah. How is that thing so aerodynamic? Look at it. It's so simple and so beautifully done. And then it's got these great spoilers in the back um, that effectively make the car a teardrop shape to the wind by redirecting air over completely over the bed. Um, that Rivian is like, I, I hated, it's not that I hated, like I felt bad for the Rivian watching it like get destroyed in the drag race because I love it. I absolutely love that truck. I don't want. I mean, who needs three one, let alone two six? 
pull 10,000 pounds and then still do bang off a zero to 60 in seven seconds. I don't know. Who needs a Cybertruck? I don't I mean, know. That's, what, that's is, what I'm trying to get to, I but, guess. Yeah. Who uses and buys this? I guess the same, anyone who wants one is the answer to that. Anyone so it's who looks at it and like, that's cool, I want it. Yeah. It's a $100,000 vehicle that is a, appears to be completely, literally bulletproof other than the glass. So it's effectively not bulletproof. Um, Which is not where your head is. Or right, exactly. So like you that. can't blow your balls off, but you can blow your brains out. Like, great. But it is the fastest and best, I would say, Handling is a more subjective thing, but its ability to be maneuverable is by far the best of any pickup truck ever made. Um, its off-road ability has got to be up there with with the best of, of the best of them, just from suspension articulation and all that yep. shit and power control right. modulation. Yep. And um, I mean, you just start looking at its benefits and its efficiency. It's all oh, whatever on on paper. It just kind of does everything better than everything else. Then the question is, do I want one? Should we want one, right? It's a hundred thousand dollars on your personal preference. Sorry, yeah. so twice as expensive as it was supposed to be. What happened? No, in because there? this is this is the three motor. You know, yeah. So how much does that one cost? Over a hundred. I'm. I'm. Was it supposed to be fifty? It was supposed to be as low as forty eventually. So, oh. but so, but I don't think. Look, the Rivian no, that hundred is was, not that much. No, no, no. Everyone's going to crucify Tesla over this. But this is the this is a two points. This is effectively a, the plaid. Think about it that way. Oh, yeah. Um, and it'll get cheaper from here on out. Um, yeah, but people are very, I think, accustomed to spending a hundred thousand dollars on things. I, of that size and yeah, the Hummer that we had there was way over a hundred. The R one T that we had, we had, it was a Lightning. We we had brought I brought a Lightning in too as a, a step in for a brilliant traditional pickup truck that happens to be electric. Um, and that was way over a hundred also. Like, I don't think the price is out of, out of control. The thing to me is, unfortunately, in a time where we politicize everything, this truck is going to be more about what it looks and what it tells people. And I think this is going to be the, the ultimate suburban assault vehicle for the, for a Lamborghini customer. Mm -hmm. that's yeah. my thing like you want to make a visual yeah, so people statement? are going to be image oriented right a lot of people will not buy it even though it's an excellent product just mm -hmm. on the basis of the statement that it makes right. and that's where the hard part for the but, team uh, for everyone who is buying one it's exactly why you buy it there's I, I am staggered at how much thought went into this thing like you know, really, they didn't need to do anything. Like, based on the way it looks and based on the public's reaction to the way it looked, Tesla just could have shit it out. They could have just made a, a conventional-ish pickup truck. They didn't need to do the gigabit. They didn't need to do the 800-volt motors, which will now trickle down to everything. They didn't need to do the 48-volt subsystem, or not subsystem, low-voltage system and steer-by-wire, which will also trickle into everything else. And by the way, that's a huge benefit for crash. You never have to worry about a steering column Intrusion. harpooning you. Yeah. Um, they didn't have to deal with this Gorilla Glass shit. Like, I was in the car, and they shot it with a two-inch ball of ice at 70 miles an hour. So they're like the highest what certification. What is the ice shooting apparatus that they have? Uh, it's an air gun. I'll show you the video. I'll put it in insert for the for these guys. But the there's the highest certification you need to be quote unquote storm proof or like you know like I guess F five hurricane windows is a two inch whatever the fuck this certification is. Don't quote me anyone. But there was a this, the certification is seventy miles an hour two inch hail ball, and it. We were in the car and I'm like, what are they doing? Huh? And and the the very nervous looking man in the driver's seat was like, uh, <clears throat> they're they're shooting the window with a two inch ice ball. And they pull out the ice ball. I'm like, get the fuck out. Like we're dead. This is gonna come through the window and kill both of us. And he's like, Yeah, just 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 lean back a little bit. And I'm like, have you done this before? And he's like, Well, they do it all the time, but I've never been in the car when we did this. And I didn't have fucking safety goggles. I mean, I was just in the car and I'm like, what? And they're like, three, two, Bam! And it hits this thing and explodes. What the fuck? What the fuck? <laughs> like, all right. They, did they need to do that? Probably not. Did they need to do, like, the doors don't have handles. There's just a little release button on it. And so then it just kind of opens it, like shoves it open. Not like the Model X where it can open all the way, but like just pushes it open. And I'm like, okay, why'd you do this? Well, arrow, this and that, and blah, 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 all these other reasons. And, uh, and I'm like, yeah, but what happens in the ice? And they're like, oh, it'll break the ice. The actuator that they have that they put in there to open the door from this thing. I don't remember what the hell the specs were, but it's like, yeah, you can basically put an inch layer of ice on it and it'll just shatter the ice and open the fucking door. 
Okay. What about the wiper? Oh, the wiper was a challenge. The wiper is four feet long. Yes, I've noticed this. The reason it has to be so long is the camera for the self-driving system is up at the top of the windshield, which is far away. And it's got to keep that clean. So now they have this four foot long thing that they have to make aerodynamically work. Um, and it's wild. It actually moves while you're driving. So as it turns out, by having it at a slight angle inboard, it's on the driver's side, it rests on the driver's side, having a slight angle inboard actually help, creates some aero advantage um, on that side of the truck. So they just move it inboard, but then put the lamination black on the glass so you can't see it from inside the car. Mm. So that gets a couple percent more uh, efficiency on the highway. And then when you have it in like intermittent mode or whatever, it not, then rests at the bottom. Why? Because if it rests here, everything that's wiped down slowly moves up the window, like when you rain yeah. something. And they had to re-engineer the fucking, the whole idea of a windshield wiper. How the hell does something that has four feet of leverage on it and needs to be able to break through ice and all the other shit that a windshield wiper has to do, how does that happen But and put enough pressure on the glass evenly that it clears it without so much pressure that it breaks the windshield or breaks the, I mean, you're like, why did you guys do this? Why didn't you just shit out? Like, why didn't you do what Rivian did? Like just shit out a, a conventional-ish looking pickup truck with a bunch of advances in it and break the break the world again. They just can't help themselves. Um, it was he just can't help himself. He can't himself, and we're all listen. We Elon has not made it very easy to like him lately. Yes, right. He's made some pretty offensive comments and some done some things that I don't particularly think we should talk about <laughs> on this podcast because everyone's going to not stop. automotive. He's. A, a very controversial person, but the man is responsible for changing the face of transportation already. And just as everyone is, no one is caught up. No one is even close, lucid, maybe, but that's all the same people that did the Model S. The traditional automakers are like a decade behind still. And we behind thought- those. Behind those cars, yes. like Model 3, Model Y, at least a decade, if not more. And we're like, okay, well, they're, they're, the ground is gaining slowly and they he just fucking walloped the entire industry with a passive aggressive PDF. Say how to develop a 48 volt vehicle. It's, I, I, you can criticize this thing all you want for how it looks and what it means and whether all of this entire thing was necessary, but holy shit, what went into this is like, I, I would, hang myself if I worked for a traditional car company right now I, out of <laughs> out of sheer embarrassment. Like when they start pulling this thing apart, their mind is going to be blown to the point of like, why do we even come to work every day? Yeah. Yeah. Like I, a seismic shift. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And the fact that it has to look like that and piss off so many people and whatever is just beside the point. Like, do we need to be driving 6,700 pound suburban assault vehicles? Yeah, so this is the, the same thing that we encountered with the Lucid, which is to say that, wouldn't it be nice if this technology were packed into a form factor that we liked better? You and I like better, right? Yes. Because it's a million people plunk down a deposit on this thing. Yes, yes. Not a million people would plunk down a deposit on a Volkswagen golf size Tesla. Correct, which correct. irritates me to Correct. no end. Yeah. But it's, eventually this stuff should, deserves to trickle down into the buy here, pay here's oh yeah. lots. Um, I'm going to just pull up an email just to make sure there's not something I f forgot. Um, oh, you took notes. I took notes. I have a million photos from this, from the factory and, um, you know, pages and pages of notes. But we did some wild shit. Um, the video is the video's great. Is it live right now? It as we record this on December first, uh, yes. When we, we are watching this, the the current plan uh, as we are recording this is December first, three a.m. Uh, California time, six a.m. Eastern. Okay. Um, the uh, yeah. So now that I've waxed, oh, first of all, I should also say I had the list of cars that I had there. Obviously, had to include a DeLorean, mm -hmm. and it also had to include a Lamborghini Lemu too. Oh yes, I had an Lemu too. Lemu too. It is. They are the same weight. Mm -hmm. They are the same superlatives. They're both the fastest pickup truck ever made. Uh, they're both 120,000 bucks. <laughs> one, one when it was new 30 years ago and the other one or 30 whatever years ago and the other one now. They're um, not $130,000 anymore. No, I wish they were. That's my favorite Lamborghini. Mm -hmm. um, but they're, it's, it was very interesting. I, I should post the link here in the, in the description. The original 
review of the Lamborghini LMO2 in Car and Driver, you could do a find and replace and replace Lamborghini LMO2 with Tesla Cybertruck and three quarters of, hmm. the, of the review works perfectly. Not even like, you know, like a, uh, like a tarot card reader is like, oh, I sense you have someone in your life named Jay. No, like dead nuts exactly applies to this. It is the fastest accelerating pickup truck in the world. Uh, never before have I driven a vehicle that gets so much attention and, and had so many people get pass out and take pictures and blah, 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 blah. And it's, it's the most closest thing to a tank. And it's the, you're just reading this. I was reading this review going, this has got to make it into the fucking icons episode it's the same thing yeah. but lamborghini sold 301 of them mm -hmm. total and tesla got a million pre-orders this thing is going to be so amazing ubiquitous but, yeah and so now that i'm done saying all the nice things about it i gotta say i think the stainless is going to be a problem for from a uh, housekeeping standpoint from a housekeeping standpoint we all have yeah. a stainless refrigerator yes uh, we all. All. <laughs> we, we all. We all. I mean, some people have white refrigerators. Okay, some Jason. people have black refrigerators. Some, but we've all seen a stainless steel refrigerator and all the fingerprints that gets on it. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, you got. You can't buff this car. You can't. You, you have to hit it with like a Brillo pad, basically, or Scotch Brite. Um, and there are sharp edges. There's one spot in the episode where I actually did slice my hand open um, as I was just walking by. And it was just like, whatever. And I get my lines, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Fuck. And we're cutting the fuck out. But the, the me looking at my arm is real. And then it sliced over. I think it was the same corner of it sliced uh, Anthony Esposito's jacket wide open. Um, you know, this is a prototype and they're yeah. working on the waviness. They're working on the sharp edges, but uh, <clears throat> like, like it, it actually bit. <laughs> Pedestrian safety. Yeah. But I'm mm, uh, interesting. Yeah. I mean, I went into this. Pedestrians fine, except for their organs are all. Well, here's <laughs> the other thing is that, you know, that we, I made a line about their pedestrian safety because the thing looks like the front of it's like six feet tall. Like you genuinely think you're going to walk up to the, the front of it. It's, it's way lower than an F-150 or any of the other trucks. And height is directly, the bluntness and heightness of, uh, heightness of the front end is def directly proportional to death rates on these trucks. And it's way lower. I don't think it's, I don't want to but get hit But you want to be a one. certain level of height, right? You want to be about waist height, right? Well, if it's too low, that's problematic. Right, yeah. But listen, I don't want to get hit by the, this steel that doesn't bend, but I don't know what's worse. That or the blunt-faced F-150, like I don't, I, these trucks are all fucking scary. I hear all this shit online about visibility. Visibility out of the thing is not bad, forward. <laughs> Back, you could run over an apartment building and probably wouldn't dent it. Um, we hit the refrigerator really hard. Didn't do any damage to it. We smashed the refrigerator. Oops. You got to watch the video. Huh. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that I thought, okay, you know, the headlights are, they work fine, but they're very, very small opening on the down on the bumper. And I thought, okay, if what happens when they get full of snow? Like you're, it's the ultimate non socko treatment of headlights. Um, they're just a bunch of things, the questions that I have, but I really did go into this whole experiment kind of hating the Cybertruck, hating everything it stood for, kind of hating the way it looked, the idea of all the excess, and I came away from it like loving Respecting it. Respecting it. No, loving it. Loving I mean, it. More than that. Yeah. What did you find lovable? The, the fact that it does so many things so well without being excessive. There's still that like lotus-like obsession with simplicity and lightweight that went into even this thing. Like the fucking aero wheel covers. Like, so it's got these, these hubcaps on them. They're rubber. The reason they're rubber is because they tried to make them out of plastic and the wheel would flex and the plastic would go flying off. So they made them out of rubber. But that means you can't curb the wheel. And they're removable, Wait, by the way. Wait, why is this problem something that has never arisen before? What is specific about this thing that causes the wheels to flex in a way that plastic does not it's suit? It's just that they wanted a, fl a, a flush cover on, that's durable that you can take off-road and can do all this other shit. That's all. And they wanted it to protrude so you don't scratch your wheels. So they made this sort of new, never-seen-before type of wheel cover that's made out of rubber. It's fucking genius. Hmm. Like I just gored the right rear wheel of my e-golf again last month. Like, damn it. That's another 300 bucks at the, at the wheel shop. Wow. To not have to fucking worry about that. The steering, 
Uh, by the end of filming, I actually re-recorded one of the segments so I can add the line. It makes you think, why the hell is steering not always been like this? Because I got into the, the Rivian afterwards. And I'm like, oh my God, don't even turn and get out of the parking spot. Um, you know, there's just, there are a couple things I don't love about it. I don't love the rear visibility. I don't love the lack of buttons. I would like to have stock stocks and shifter for a shifter and turn signal. But like, the more you drive the thing around, you're like, this thing rides like a fucking dream. That's the other thing. Like at first I bitched about the ride and then I realized it's only because I was in beast mode or whatever I think it's called beast mode. Um, put it in regular ride and it's Rolls Roycean in its ride. It handles really well. Not None of the limit handling magic that's, that Lucid's capable of. No Tesla has ever come close to that, but it handles quite well as you'll see in the uh, go-kart race. It The, the brakes are indefatigable i mean i had them quite on fire i don't think they were on fire but they were definitely on smoke never stopped working didn't give a shit um and this is racing a 6700 pound truck on a go-kart track mm -hmm. um and then the consistency and acceleration for at battery state of charge and just the thoughtfulness that went into every single part of this truck that they didn't have to do that's the crazy thing they didn't have to do anything they could have shit it out made it look the way it did and it would have been done but they didn't and then to watch that crash test at the end and you're like, wait a second, what? Like the car just didn't give a fuck about a 3,100 pound sled? Yeah, so Porsche should go home. All the legacy manufacturers making EVs. Okay, I was, Porsche shouldn't go home because they make a 911 GT3. Right, but the Taycan should go home. Taycan should go home. They should be humiliated. I'm sorry, Mercedes, the, that, like if I look at what Mercedes has done to their, that fucking company that we love so much with the EQS, yes. which is, we discussed, EQE. one of the worst consumer products ever <laughs> slight exaggeration but currently, currently available currently available one of the worst cars you could buy while they're trying to be reinventing everything and make it and you have a fucking startup that's like we're done with fuses we're done with cross wire uh, cross car wiring we're done with ladder frames we're done with unitary construction we're done with paint shop we're done with all of this other shit we've just had it we're throwing it all out fuck your suppliers fuck your dysfunction Fuck your 12 volt shit. We're just doing it our way from start to finish. Oh, and then we're throwing it out and doing it again because it wasn't good enough. The fuck? The <sighs> fuck? Like, I just, I thought the world was finally going to catch up to Tesla. I want this kind of thinking in a product that I actually want. Yeah, me too. Yeah. But I... Uh, from Tesla or Lucid? From anyone, I don't care. Yes, I mean, the best part about, about the best part about Elon is from start to finish, he has said the Tesla's mission is to accelerate the advancement of the electron of the electric car and sustainable transportation. Blah 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 blah. And so he has open source shared everything they do with every other car company, and they're all so fucking dumb they don't even steal his homework. Like he's like, here it is, and they still won't copy what he is doing. <laughs> and even ten years ahead of everybody else, I mean, go watch one of them and Rowan Associates teardowns of all like Tesla's and you get like, you know, the Toyota CEOs going, Oh fuck. They're like a decade and a half ahead of us. Shit. They still don't do anything about it. And now Tesla with that kind of lead is, and now the best selling car on the planet with the model Y, although there's some arguing about that. Maybe Corolla might've beat it, whatever, blah, blah, blah. It's up there. And now they're like, watch this. We're just going to reinvent the whole car. And so the next Model Again. 3, the NY and S and X and whatever else they're going to do, Roadsters next. Like, holy shit, what the fuck? If this fucking pickup truck on two uh, on mud tires can do 0 to 60 in 2.6 seconds without a chirp from the tires because the traction control is that good, what in the fuck is that Roadster going to do? Didn't they say 1.9? Yeah, <laughs> but they're going to beat that now because the Lucid Air does 1.89, <laughs> the Sapphire. So they can't, so sorry, they're never going to, I mean, what a time to be an engineer for one of the, those companies. And sorry to every other car company on the planet. That's I wish hatchbacks and station wagons were not the last thing that we're ever going. I mean, we're just going to kill them and they're never going to get rendered in this way. No. At some point, commuter cars will become electric and, and this. It, we're just going to have to wait 20. That's the sad part is by the time the regulars catch up, to what Tesla's doing, we'll be too old. To, you'll especially be too old to drive. We'll be too old to be alive. Possibly. Yeah. Well. Anyway, ama amazing, because it was such an about face. I went into the video incredibly thankful to, for, to Tesla for the opportunity to be one of apparently three people in the world to drive it. 
Um, but I went in with this, Oh God, how am I going to make this positive? Like, you know, I can't bite the hand that feeds me. So I'm like, well, I'll just make it all about information and I'll just be all about information. And I don't put my opinion in there. But during the course of filming, I went from thinking, Oh God, why the fuck did they do this to like, wow, why the fuck did they do this? They didn't have to, but they did it. And that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Now looking forward to that technology, maybe not being in something that I wouldn't want to park in front of my house because of what it says mm -hmm. in the same way that I wouldn't want to park a Hummer or I wouldn't park. I mean, I would totally park an LMO too. Yes. But you know, oldness does that. It removes the douchiness. Yeah. Nothing like time to erode the douchiness. Yeah, that's true. right. You wouldn't yeah. do it with an Aventador, but you would with a Countach. Absolutely. But in period, I wouldn't do it with a Countach. No. Yeah. And I wouldn't do it with a Porsche now, mm -hmm. like a GT3. Yes, I would. I'd hide it in the back. Yes, but you'd own it. Along with the bodies that I would have had to bury in order to be able to afford. Of GP3. course. <laughs> it goes without saying. Um, no, no, no. Not everyone can afford to take their bodies elsewhere to dispose of them. You have to dispose of them in the comfort of your own home. Gotta because do what you got to do. Gotta check your privilege. Whatever it takes to buy a uh, Porsche GT car. All that's fair. the real answer. Um, okay, well, that was very illuminating. I'm sorry. I think we went over. This is a longer uh, This is a special Friday episode if we manage to actually get it out yeah Friday. for all the people who bitched that we missed one week there because well i was filming because you were this. filming this mm -hmm. <laughs> um now you know why yep. so now you got your bonus episode um i encourage everyone to please go watch that video and share it with people because the saddest thing for me was to watch the faces of all of the people who gave me the tours all the engineers who gave me their tours so there was production engineers and there were chassis engineers and um and what I clearly saw from everyone is they are so beaten down <laughs> as human beings, right? We can bitch about Elon because he's not really a human being. He's a public figure, right? That's not, that was a joke. You're supposed to, supposed to laugh. But Elon is larger than life, right? Elon can take care of himself. The people who work for him have gotten so much shit for the last four years about this. And not just from Elon, part. but a lot from, of it from Elon. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> from everyone. And I could see it on all of their faces. They couldn't wait to show me what they did. And they were so proud of these accomplishments and they're so excited about all of it. And they're like, we just can't wait for the world to see this. And you know why? It's because everyone formed their fucking opinion about this thing. Mm -hmm. Everyone took one look at it and either were like, I have to have it or fuck that Elon guy, fuck this company. What a sick joke. This is Elon's ego running completely out of fucking control. Look at that fucking window breaking. How stupid is this? And they had to clean up that mess twice yes. over four years and they can't wait to get it out. So my... I am very touched by what I think is going to be the public's reaction to this thing um, when people get behind the wheel of it. Because these people who have endured all this shit. Um, Let us hope that its first impression is not so strong that no one can objectively look at it. Invariably, that's going to happen. It would have. Had I not gotten the engineering background, I don't think I would have. That was, that was the biggest mindfuck, is I don't think I would have ever been as impressed by this thing as and what consumers are going to actually you're not, perceive you don't, all that right the, my first impression was whoa the fucking steering's wild like okay two minutes later it was fine but that first impression was like yeah somebody's gonna hit a curb they are but it you're not gonna but you're not gonna, gonna scrape the, the wheel right yes um you know you, it, you're gonna you're gonna have to take a little while to get used to not being able to see out the back and trusting the little camera is it as good as a mirror absolutely not could you drive with the tonneau down and lose 10% range? Sure, that's exactly what I would do. I'd, put the, I'd keep the mirror in and use it. But I don't think anyone who's driving one of these, or who's gonna buy one of these cars is really that concerned with utility and usability in the same way that anyone who drives a Lamborghini doesn't really give a shit. However, there happens to be real engineering substance behind the Lamborghini stuff. Like the, the last of the Huracans were genuinely tremendous. Um, and same thing here. There's all kinds of capability in here. We'll see if Elon's dream um, is shared by millions of others about what the future of a pickup People truck People like trucks, like. especially in this country. But will they accept something that is this different? Is my question. Truck people, regular old dyed in the wool, I live in the middle of America and drive an F-150 every day, people. Mm -hmm. People who buy an F-150 Lightning or people who use, or contractors, right? Immediately, my Anthony was like, no fucking contractors ever gonna drive this thing, ever. Fuck this, whatever. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait. Think about this for a second. You have 100% lockable storage. That's not just like, oh, I put a cap on the bed of my pickup truck and lock it and so anyone can break in or just, you know, a steel toolbox. 
actual lockable storage. And then you have, I think it's a six kilowatt, 240 volt plug at the back. So you can just run your welder or like anything else you want. Oh, and you can do zero to 16, 2.6 seconds. Um, and all these other little benefits of Tesla's connected apps and the charging network and data. You start adding in as a contractor and, and I don't have to worry about a door ding. I don't have to worry about smacking into something slow at slow speeds in a parking lot. You know, contractors always hit shit because, you know, contractors, because work sites are like hazardous. Hazardous. I, you just start thinking from the perspective of the people who really use these things. I don't know about it. They might actually, it could work. It mm. could work. I don't know. I'm super curious to see if, uh, if it's adopted by the sort of worker crowd. But, you know, oh, I need to get to this job site and it's like there's 12 inches of mud. I throw it. Pretty cool mm. benefit. I don't know. Uh, I, amazing. Amazing. I don't, my mind is not blown that often in this industry. And I hate that it continues to be blown by like fucking Lucid and Tesla. Because I know Exclusively. That, well, well, Porsche. I mean, there are other car companies that are doing great shit occasionally, but not like this. Like this is like, oh God, stop it, guys. You're embarrassing everyone else. And they still aren't going after it, so carry on. Literally gave them homework. Let's see how long it takes for every other car company to start using 48 volt everything. It's going to be years, is my prediction. You know, they're like, oh, we used a 48 volt suspension actuator, or oh, we have a 48 volt mild hybrid system. What the fuck does that do for the rest of the entire car? You know, your friggin' heater that's. AMG using. 53, anyone? Oh, God. Anyway, um, fascinating story. I hope, uh, I can't wait to hear, I heard uh, Marquez uh, has driven driven it and Jack Ricks from Top Gear. That's mm. what I've been told. Um, and I can't wait to see what they have to say. Because right now I'm like on an island by myself, haven't talked to anyone who's driven it. So could be that I got it all wrong and everyone- Well, you got the it. engineering story, which they may not have gotten. They so yeah, absent apparently not. that, then uh, they might have a very different impression of it. Yeah. That, that would be fascinating. If they both are like, this is unnecessary and it's ex excessive, and they didn't bring a set of scales to see that it was actually lighter, you know, like maybe, ah, it's so fascinating. So fascinating. This is a kind of a, I don't want to say a once in a career opportunity, but a very, very rare one. So, looking forward to hearing all the hate. <laughs> Yay. Okay. okay. Well, that's been this week of the, this week, this Friday uh, episode of the Carmudgeon Show. Special edition. Special edition Cybertruck embargo delete episode. Yes. Uh, join us perhaps Monday. We might yep. have one on Monday. Yeah. A smaller we'll one on Monday. A smaller truck. Smaller episode of the Carmudgeon oh, Show. Oh, yeah, sure. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.